This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Chapter 9 deals with risk, and this is a very important concept for your exam. It, you will be frequently asked to describe the various types of risk. ISA 315, and by the way, you are not required and will get no marks for quoting ISA numbers or titles, but the requirement on the auditor is to obtain an understanding of the entity and its environment sufficient to identify and assess the risk of material misstatement in the financial statements. So wherever there's a high risk area that you've identified, uh, uh, then that's the, the area that your audit planning would say you should put in sufficient effort to be able to collect the correct amount of evidence to back up your opinions. Strictly speaking, risk divides into two sorts. There's business risk and there is what's called audit risk. And for F8, really business risk isn't of... It, 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 strictly speaking, business risk is not on the syllabus. You will not really be asked about business risk, except that these items down here are, I suppose, indicators of going concern. Problems. The only place you'd be asked to maybe identify or talk about uh, something like financial risk is if borrowings were very high and they couldn't pay the interest. There's obviously a going concern issue there. Operational risk would be like losing key members of staff, like your technology uh, becoming old and you not bringing forward uh, new products. Uh, compliance risk, uh, where you break a law or regulation, uh, which is going to put at risk maybe your right to keep trading, or maybe will cause large fines and financial penalties to be paid there. But that's the only place that business risk comes into the F8 syllabus. What we're concerned about in F8 is what's called audit risk, and this is the risk of an inappropriate opinion. In other words, the auditors say that the financial statements show a true and fair view. That means that the financial statements do not, in the auditor's opinion, contain a material misstatement, when in fact they do. So you've given a clean audit report when it should have been qualified or perhaps adverse. It could, of course, potentially work the other way. Uh, you give a qualified audit report, you think uh, maybe that uh, that receivable is never going to be paid to us, uh, and you object to the way in which the directors have uh, treated that receivable in the financial statements. It's there in full, and uh, it turns out that it is actually going to be received. We don't want to make those errors because uh, uh, this is misleading the users. It is a, um, not a great outcome from the audit. So it contributes to the risk of an inappropriate decision uh, eventually being published, if you like, in the financial statements. And this uh, audit risk model is what you really need to be thinking about. At the top, we have something which is called the risk of material misstatement. Now, what you have to imagine uh, is that you go uh, in to do the audit and your client will uh, kind of present you with a set of draft accounts. OK, so there are financial statements here. You haven't done any work on them yet. This is what you're going to be examining. And this risk of material misstatement is talking about the risk that these draft financial statements have within them a material misstatement. How could there be a material misstatement in these financial statements? And essentially, two things have to happen. First of all, an error has to be made. So in the first place, an error has to be made. Then secondly, nothing or nobody within the company has picked up and corrected that error. 
The first type of those risks, the risk that an error occurs in the first place, is called inherent risk. What contributes to inherent risk? Well, it could be uh, that uh, many of your accounting staff have left during the year and the people who are now there are relatively inexperienced. This must increase the risk that an error has occurred. Changing your IT system will increase the risk that an error has occurred. You have to transfer all of those balances uh, and then people are working on the system that they, you know, they're not quite familiar with. The, the chances are there's some errors coming from that. Uh, we talked earlier about a, a jewellery shop where you have got a high number of very high value but small items which are potentially easy to confuse, easy to be mislaid or even uh, stolen. There is a high inherent risk there. Cash businesses. Cash can easily be uh, 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 you know, defrauded from the company. A business with very complex transactions. So if we think about the, the banking crisis in 2008, uh, many of the uh, what are called derivatives that the banks were dealing with, futures and options contracts and really, really, really very complex financial products, uh, there's a high chance that you get them wrong uh, and and that uh, uh, you know people simply don't understand how these should be treated or maybe the way the contracts uh, should be written. So, the high risk that some error occurs in the first place. And then what we need, secondly, okay, the error occurs, but then it must not be picked up. There must not be uh, what's called a control in place within the company. The auditor isn't close to them yet, but there isn't internal controls in place which would pick up the error. So if we're worried about uh, inventory going missing, that's a high risk, a good control would be to make sure that when you are taking the, the diamond rings out of the jewellery shop window at night, you do a, an inventory count then. Uh, another control is that when you're kind of sorting and looking at them, uh, you have given training to the uh, staff so they know you know, a good diamond from a bad diamond, they, they, they know how to classify this, they know how to find out how to uh, uh, to, to, to describe it and so on. Another control risk, if you're in a cash business, is that every night you put the cash in the bank. You don't leave it lying around in the office or in the shop because that, that increases the risk. Only if a problem gets through both of these uh, 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 type of barriers, if you like, the, the, the problem has occurred and then nobody picks it up. Will it be published in these draft accounts? And once it's published in these draft accounts, there is only one thing stopping that getting out to the members, getting into the wild, so to speak. And that is a work that the auditor does, the detection risk. So if the auditor does lots and lots and lots of work, the auditor might be able to redeem the situation. There's an error in here that's got in here because of high inherent risk and the control risk is high. But then the auditor does lots of work and spots the error before it gets out into the published financial statements. Now, these are presented here as a kind of equation here. We have the resultant audit risk. We're saying depends on the inherent risk depends on the control risk and depends on the detection risk. <clears throat> so, if the inherent risk is high, something like a jewellery shop, high cash business, uh, new staff, a lot of time pressure in getting the financial statements out, that would all be inherent risk. If the control risk is high, and that means there's bad internal control, there's a high risk that the controls will not pick up the problem, the only way you can get this low, because we always want this low, okay? Nobody wants to be suffering a high audit risk. The auditor wants to be uh, have a really good chance that there is no misstatement within the published financial statement. You want that low. The only way you can get that low is by having this very low, which means uh, that you do a lot of audit work to reduce the detection risk, to reduce the chance that you as auditor will not pick up these errors because you are the last 
defence mechanism, if you like, before this error gets into the wild. If, however, uh, the inherent risk was fairly low, uh, so we're dealing with a simple business, there's no cash about the place, the inventory is uh, not particularly desirable, not particularly portable and so on, uh, the, the staff has been there for a long time, etc., no big changes. If the control risk is low, in other words, you have a very good internal control system, system of supervision and checks and authorizations, reconciliation, stock counts, cash counts, all the things uh, that were going to be contributing to good financial control, then you'd actually get away with the detection risk, in a way, being quite high. Because a low times a low times a high is going to come out probably quite low. And what we're saying is that in such a situation, the auditor has to do less work. We can live with doing less detective work, if you like, uh, because the chances that we're going to find anything anyway are pretty low. And if you remember back when I described the, the two car companies, when we were saying there were two kind of routes down an audit, we can decide to uh, basically rely on internal controls, or if there are no internal controls, we, we have to do a lot of substantive tests. This is, in a way, another version of that. I said in the American car company, which had fantastic controls, uh, the audit fee was about a hundred thousand, uh, because relatively little work had to be done on the audit because of the chance of an error being in the financial statements was low. But in the British government uh, car company, which was comprised of several car companies squashed together, and they had no good accounting control system at all. The order fee was about five times higher because it was recognised there there's a very high inherent risk, very high control risk, and the only way the auditors are going to crack it is by doing a awful lot of audit work. That's the only way they will get the audit risk down. So basically uh, what the auditor is doing is kind of adjusting the amount of work they do uh, to match, if you like, the sort of risk which they find in the client, the inherent risk and the control risk. What gives rise to detection risk? Uh, what, what, what gives rise to the chance that the auditor will not detect a material financial statement, uh, a, a material misstatement in the financial statements? And here there are two sorts. First of all, there is sampling risk. We will see that it's extremely rare for auditors to look at all the transactions in the business. It's simply not economical. It would take almost a year to, to do it and so on. And auditing relies on sampling. Now, what we're really talking about here in sampling risk is bad luck in sampling. Uh, so I could pick maybe 50 invoices uh, to see if somebody had signed those invoices uh, as being approved. What I'm doing there is I'm testing that a controller is operating. I could pick 50 invoices, let's say out of 10,000, find that all 50 had been properly approved. Uh, but of course, there is a risk uh, that most of the remaining 10,000 were not actually approved. And I've just been a bit unlucky in my sampling. I've got the 50 good ones, so to speak, uh, but actually most of what's there haven't been properly approved. The way you reduce sampling risk here, this will go down if the sample size goes up. So obviously, if instead of picking 50 invoices that I look at, uh, I look at 100 invoices or 200 invoices, the chance that I don't pick up or begin picking up these unauthorized invoices is going to be much lower. Non-sampling risk is a curious definition. Non-sampling risk is defined as any risk which doesn't arise from sampling. Uh, the sort of things which can give rise to non-sampling risk is the auditor doesn't know what the document means that's been looked at. So, for example, me, you could take me into a bank. Uh, I could examine, let's say, all of the complex financial derivative products that the bank has. In other words, it's 100% sampling. But in many ways, I would be no wiser. 
because I wouldn't I wouldn't understand the 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 the, the implications of many of these um, uh, contracts. I wouldn't know if they were good or bad, if they were safe or dangerous. The way you get round non-sampling risk is in the, the following. Basically, you need good planning. You can get around it by training. Uh, you can get around it by uh, a proper assignment of tasks. So in other words, you, you give the hard bit of the audit to the more experienced person uh, who will be able to uh, spot that there are problems and so on in it, and you get around it by review. So you plan where the tricky areas are, you train people properly, maybe to deal with certain specific uh, unique contracts in this bank or insurance company and so on. You give the tricky areas to the person with the training and the person with the experience. Uh, and then anyway, after that person has looked at those transactions, it's maybe going to be reviewed by the supervisor, reviewed by the manager, reviewed by the partner. And hopefully at one of these levels, as people get more senior, more skilled, more experienced, uh, then they will pick up that something isn't right. The risk uh, that we're looking at uh, comes in two uh, levels. There is what's called a financial statement level and an assertion level. We have to get uh, the risks of both down to acceptable levels. I'll deal first with the assertion level. We'll be coming on to looking what's meant by an assertion fairly soon. Uh, but what, what a, an assertion is that if you see, for example, a receivable in the financial statements, uh, then one of the things about receivables is that you want to make sure what should it be valued at. Uh, should we reduce its value because we think this isn't going to be paid or it isn't all going to be paid and, and so on. You want to make sure uh, that the receivable actually exists at year end, that it wasn't just kind of paid before year end, and we're kind of double counting cash and receivable. That's the assertion level. It's looking at its you know, individual figures and qualities about the individual figures that the assertions will make. This is looking down at the kind of detail, almost with a magnifying glass at each of these figures. What you also need to do, uh, and this tends to be at the higher levels within the company, the managers and the partner, you want to stand back and look at the financial statements as a whole, the financial statement level, to see whether or not the way maybe they're being presented is fair. To some extent, the assertion level is looking almost at the true aspects not, it's not quite right, but it, but it gives a, a decent indication. The assertion levels uh, are kind of look at that. The assertion levels kind of looking at is the figure true, and the financial statement level is looking more. Has it been fairly presented? Is it going to be misleading someone? And really, it's experience which you need to uh, satisfy yourself that the risk is at an acceptably low level at the financial statement level. Here are some examples uh, of uh, the different categories of risk. We have mentioned these before, but it's worth again going round about that random again. The inherent risk, strict definition, the susceptibility uh, to misstatement that could be material, assuming no related internal controls. In other words, the susceptibility of an error happening in the first place. Examples we have here complex transactions, so the, the accounting staff gets confused, inexperienced staff, cash-based business, pressure to perform, uh, where perhaps uh, there is pressure to overvalue assets or, or to maybe take sales before they've really been properly earned. Uh, pressure to get the financial statements out quickly is obviously going to increase the risk of uh, errors being made in the first place. Secondly, control risk, the risk of the material misstatement will not be prevented, detected or corrected. Something called the control environment, which we need to look at. Uh, briefly at this stage, the control environment is almost the culture in the organization. 
is it an organization where controls are treasured where you're expected to do things carefully and properly or is it a, an organization which is a bit sloppy there is the internal control system and its design there is the internal control system and and whether or not it is operating properly whether people are following the rules and procedures which have been laid down within the internal control system and finally uh, detection risk the failure of the auditor to detect a material misstatement now that happens as i say the the error which is in the draft financial statements now gets into the published financial statements and is going to be doing potential harm to the members of the company uh, what increases this well it's the auditor's experience uh, and if you have a new client then the detection risk tends to be a bit higher uh, you uh, don't know where the problem areas might be in a client you don't know uh, how good the client's people are how reliable they are and so on you don't properly understand maybe the, the business that the client is operating in you should understand it but of course you're on a bit of a learning curve if it's a new client uh, a lot of uh, time pressure to hit those fees uh, and what auditors ought to do if fee level is there and you know the actual cost of the audit is, is going up you can't you can't just stop work when you get to that fee level uh, you have to keep kind of going up because your reputation and the audit depends on you doing whatever work is necessary uh, to be able to collect sufficient appropriate audit evidence that's why in the engagement letters that we talked about earlier we have to mention fees but generally speaking you'll be saying something like the fee will be 200,000 provided we don't find any, any unexpected errors or any unexpected problems you want to leave the door open so that if more work is required you can perhaps re renegotiate the audit fee uh, poor planning so that perhaps you don't give appropriate time and attention to the big areas which uh, are susceptible to material misstatement perhaps we don't understand the, the industry I, I used the example of a bank which has got exotic uh, derivative contracts the insurance uh, business is another one which has got some perhaps unique uh, ways of accounting uh, and if you don't understand that how could the auditor possibly detect that there's an error in the financial statements